Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show and happy Friday. We begin today with an exclusive interview, a victory for free speech and an important defeat for the cancel culture mob. We first told you about the case of constitutional law expert Ilya Shapiro back in February. He had recently been hired by Georgetown Law, but just days before he was scheduled to start his new job, Ilya sent out a tweet questioning President Biden's decision to limit who he would be considering for the soon to be vacant Supreme Court seat based on their race and their sex. The tweet received immediate pushback, and while Shapiro repeatedly apologized, saying he had phrased it inartfully, there was a reference to, quote, a lesser black woman, it wasn't enough for the vultures who demanded that Georgetown revoke his employment contract. Four months of investigation of his tweet followed until Georgetown finally said yesterday that he could start the job he had been hired to do, with some caveats. Today, Ilya officially begins his job as executive director of the Center for the Constitution and senior lecturer at the Georgetown University Law Center. And this is his first interview about it. Ilya, thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you, Megan. Congrats on your victory. Thank you. Uh, As I wrote in the Wall Street Journal, it's a technical victory, not quite a victory for free speech. Don't want to oversell it. The university did not say, yes, I'm protected by their excellent Uh, freedom of expression policy. They just said, oh, uh, we forgot to look at the calendar. And it turns out I was not an employee when I tweeted. So all of these policies they've been investigating me under uh, don't apply. Uh, Kind of ominous, uh, indicating that if I or some other faculty member in the future were to have an errant tweet, uh, then that might be a whole other story. Yeah. So let's go back for the viewers who haven't been following this as closely uh, as some of us who are, you know, in this atmosphere, this sort of center, center right uh, media atmosphere, because this caused quite a firestorm for us. I mean, all of us have been outraged by what they've been doing to you. It was a tweet. It wasn't perfectly worded. You've copped to that. But just tell us what you were trying to say. Um, and I I can find the tweet in front of me, but I'm sure you have it memorized by this point. Tell us, <laughs> just walk us through how it went. Yeah, so this was uh, back in January, January 26th, to be precise, when news of Justice Breyer's retirement leaked. Uh, And I was doing media all day. I put out statements. I was still at Cato at the time where I was uh, vice president and and director of their constitutional studies shop uh, and commenting on the Supreme Court because that's my area of expertise. You see my my books behind me, Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations and the Politics of America's Highest Court. And that evening, I was still upset uh, about President Biden's decision to limit his pool of candidates by race and sex. He said that it would be a black woman, as uh, he promised uh, uh, during the presidential election campaign. And, uh, you know, but not best fo- not following best practices. I was doom scrolling on Twitter that night in my mm-hmm. hotel room. I happened to be on a, on a trip in, in Austin, Texas, uh, and was just getting upset about commentary and thinking about, um, you know, what, what have we come to that, uh, you know, with the, the, the racial preferences that uh, have uh, invaded all of our lives uh, have now come to even um, high public office. It's anathema to, I think, how people should be treated. And I thought to myself, you know, uh, the best person for this job, if I were a Democratic president, would be the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit, uh, Judge Jackson's colleague, Sri Srinivasan, who happens to be an Indian American immigrant, uh, excellent judge, was on President Obama's shortlist for the spot that eventually went to Merrick Garland. And I said, well, by operation of logic, that means that everyone else is less qualified. And if you know, President Biden said it was going to be a black woman, so I said, well, I guess we're going to be, based on today's hierarchy of intersectionality, uh, as I cheekily uh, put it, uh, we're going to end up with a, quote, lesser black woman. And those three words are what got me in trouble. I, of mm. course, meant less qualified uh, black woman because everybody, uh, by operation of logic, was going to be less qualified than the person I thought would be the most qualified. Uh, and away we went. I went to bed at that point, And it was only when I woke up the next morning that I saw that a firestorm had erupted uh, on Twitter I thought, you know, I really did not phrase that well. I had been in a kind of a festy and a feisty mood after a friend's uh, birthday or, or a, <laughs> a, a employment celebration, actually, at, at a restaurant. And uh, uh, so I thought I, I should delete this. I should. This is not this. This firestorm is detracting from the point I want to make that, you know, uh, that 76 percent of Americans agreed with that all 
candidates should be considered. Uh, so I deleted it and I said, look, I, I meant no offense, but this was poorly phrased. I'm taking it down. Uh, but by that point, it was it was too late. The knives were out uh, and things snowballed and quickly moved from from Twitter uh, to real life. Uh, the dean put out a statement uh, attacking me and calling me an appalling racist. Uh, and away we went. <laughs> this same dean right now, was it trainer? It is, yes. Oh, wow. So, I mean, this is a guy who's now saying, okay, welcome to Georgetown. So there's some awkwardness <laughs> there. It was, I think National Review, Rich Lowry had a, a piece saying, in any sane world, you're taking down that tweet and explaining what you were trying to say would have been the end of this. They're like, it's Twitter. It's Twitter. It's not sworn testimony before the Congress or a Supreme Court brief where you think things out very carefully and have it reviewed by five different people. It's Twitter. It's a stupid late night tweet. Who? I mean, who hasn't sent something out on Twitter that they'd like to have back? But the vultures, as you say, saw an opportunity and they were excited to get you. Now, just by way of background, can you explain like your own politics and what this constitutional center that you were hired to be the executive director of at Georgetown do? Because these are these are more right leaning organizations. I mean, like the, I was surprised, too. I didn't actually know about this. But when I see their mission, I'm like, oh, well, this is a little bit more conservative. So I'm sure it already had a big red bullseye over it. Yeah, I was hired to uh, to heighten their profile so people like you would know all about it. It's actually celebrating its 10th anniversary. Uh, Randy Barnett, who's a, a celebrated uh, law professor, uh, one of, I think, three, I would be the fourth uh, at, at the entire Georgetown faculty who's not uh, on the left, who's not progressive of some stripe. Uh, he's a libertarian. Uh, I'm a classical liberal, I guess you could, you could say. Um, I was born in the Soviet Union, and my parents uh, brought me out when I was little, when I was four. We came to Canada uh, and enjoyed immigrating so much, I had to come to America as well. Uh, like I, I like to say that like most immigrants, I do a job that uh, most native born Americans won't. And that's defending the Constitution. Um, so uh, after a, a cup of coffee in big law, which was not that much fun, I came to the Cato Institute and uh, wrote uh, briefs for the Supreme Court, edited the Cato Supreme Court review, did my own writing, both academic and popular, gave a lot of speeches. I've been doing media for a long time. Uh, and after nearly 15 years at Cato, which is uh, the nation's premier libertarian think tank, I thought, you know, uh, how can I have more impact or a new, have a new challenge? And uh, Randy Barnett, who's become a friend and a, and a mentor, uh, thought that it would be a good fit to have someone of my profile, my skills, my network come to the center and especially be the public face and get more engagement from judges and practitioners and publications uh, and media and all of that. Uh, to push uh, the importance of the Constitution and originalist analysis, looking at the Constitution uh, by what the original public meaning uh, of its provisions are. A lot of people call that conservative, but it doesn't have to be. There are progressive originalists or living originalists. There's all sorts of different stripes. So it's more academic -y and nerdy in, in certain ways, uh, but still very relevant uh, to the discourse and certainly to the Supreme Court, where now a, a majority for the first time, do call themselves some flavor uh, of originalist. It, it kind of reminds me of the Kevin Williamson situation with the Atlantic, where the Atlantic's like, let's hire Kevin Williamson. That's the, that, he'll be great. People really like him. And then they found out, oh, Kevin Williamson doesn't sound like all the rest of our writers. He says things that to us are awful, but to at least half the country are perfectly reasonable and fine. And then they're like, oh, no, my God, what have we done? Right. I feel like there was a little bit of that going on with Georgetown. Like, oh, it, it doesn't sound like the rest of us. It doesn't <laughs> look like the rest of us. It says weird things about, you know, race and, and gender not being the be all end all. And this adherence to identity politics seems to offend this guy. What what on earth? So I'm mocking it because if we've seen it so many times, it's just laughable. But you point out in your Wall Street Journal op-ed, which hit late last night, um, this is an experience I wouldn't wish on anyone except perhaps the instigators of the Twitter mob that launched this tempest, particularly the first few days, which were truly terrible for me and my family. Can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, my wife had actually warned me a couple of days, uh, a couple of days before my tweet, we were out celebrating her birthday. And she said, you know, you're joining an academic institution now, you have to be careful, particularly about race and sex. And then I sort of step in it, which isn't meaning that my tweet is a firing offense or disciplining offense. But 
Um, I uh, opened the door for uh, my political enemies to, to go after me. And that's, and that's a one-way street. I mean, lots of law professors and other professors on the left uh, say all sorts of things, way more outrageous than, 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 than what I did, even mm-hmm. uh, interpreted in its uh, uh, worst light. Uh, and yet uh, Georgetown did, did nothing for them. But anyway, my personal experience, right? So I woke up that morning uh, in that Austin uh, hotel room and, and saw what was going on. And I felt sick to my stomach uh, and mm-hmm. especially uh, come around noontime when the dean issued his statement. Uh, I thought, OK, I'm going to get fired. I was transitioning jobs from from Cato to Georgetown. I'm, how can I provide for my family? I have two little boys who are four and six. Um, this is uh, horrific. I've blown up my life. I've you know, it was honestly, Megan, the probably the second worst day of my life. Uh, the worst being when my mom passed when I was in college. Um, I, I really thought, you know, I'd, I'd worked hard my whole life. I, uh, had done everything right, went to the right schools, uh, built a platform for myself as a, uh, inserted myself into the national conversation about many important issues on the Supreme Court and, uh, the Constitution, public affairs, lots of different things. And with one, uh, bad tweet, I had just, I had just killed that. And what am I going to do? Um, and it was just the most horrific, horrific feeling. And as I worked with my allies and friends uh, over the, over that day and the coming home and in the coming days, uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, FIRE, which I told uh, them is now my my favorite uh, nonprofit organization. I'm going to become their them. number one fundraiser. Um, uh, other, other folks, just so many people came out of the woodwork, good friends, you know, acquaintances who I hadn't seen or talked to in 10 years. How can I help? Uh, Lot, you know, this is one thing I learned from this whole experience, just exactly who my friends are and how many I have. I'm truly blessed in that department. I'd, I'd rather not have had reason to uh, to learn about all that. But, mm-hmm. but nevertheless, those first few days were I, I, the, the, I have a metaphor that the first few days were hell. And then once the dean decided that he was going to let me uh, join the uh, Georgetown, be onboarded, but immediately be placed on leave. And then that leave became purgatory. So I had four days of hell and I couldn't sleep. There were physical manifestations in my health, uh, my wife as well. I mean, we try to keep things from our, from our kids, but they can sense when, when something's bothering mommy and daddy. Uh, and then it became purgatory and it was kind of a roller coaster of emotions. Um, you know, I, I made the best of, of that uh, situation going, you know, became sort of an inadvertent poster boy for, for cancel culture and whatnot, but uh, great personal and, and professional instability. And, and today I'm with you, the day after that purgatory uh, ended. Uh, I'm not sure we're quite in heaven at this point to push mm-hmm. the metaphor even further. Uh, but those first few days you asked me about, I, I really, I mean, it was, um, you know, we talk politically and we try to frame things and I had good crisis PR advice and things like that. Uh, but the the personal toll was just visceral. Yeah, I I can relate. And I think it's uh, we skip over that too quickly in these situations, no matter how they end. You know, I've said before one other time on this show, when I had my show canceled at NBC, I had the same feeling, the sleepless nights, like this stunned feeling of what just happened to me. Is my career entirely gone? All Everything I've worked so hard for, you know, nothing matters. Only Only this one moment seems to matter. And will it be used to destroy me? Will I emerge from this? And I, I was seeing a therapist who I'd been seeing for years, you know, I, I, I hired him. I went and started seeing him in 2011. Um, but anyway, he offered me antidepressants and I refused Ilya because the one thing I was certain of was Andy Lack was not going to put me on antidepressants. Like I, for me, that was the hard line. Like I'm, I'm not doing that. I will not give that guy that power. And for me, it's a badge of honor. There's nothing wrong with antidepressants at all. I know a lot of people for whom they've done a lot of good. But it was like in that moment, I couldn't let that happen. You know what I'm saying? It was like that to me meant something in my little private battle. So I get it. It's, these are people don't understand the like deep emotional toll these decisions can have. And, it, you know, it's not so much the Twitter mob. You know, I've I've, I've had attacks and and you know, the kind of snark that the, the, the surreality of, of all of the online stuff 
it was the fact that I might be unemployed, that my reputation would be destroyed forever over a tweet. Um, yeah. And how did I let this happen? And how am I hurting my family? Um, yeah, that was, um, that was that was that was pretty horrible. Then you have. So it's what it's one thing if it's just like the dean who's looking to CYA and you're like, OK, you know, it's like your boss is basically looking to punish you for a little while, you know, just to make himself look like he cares. That's one thing. But you had the Black Law Students Association at Georgetown demanding that your employment be rescinded. Uh, we pulled up that statement. Forgive me. But they demanded the revocation of your employment contract and that the uh, college uh, condemn your quote racist tweets at Georgetown Law. Black students are haunted by the shadow of imposter syndrome. Shapiro reinforced this phenomenon by reducing black women's accomplishments and so on. It goes on. But that stuff hurts too because now you've got whole groups of minority you know, coalitions coming together to basically condemn you as racist without any appreciation for the context or the apology or the, you know, everything that you said thereafter. Well, that's why the Dean acted as he did, uh, why he first condemned me and then why he uh, uh, put me on administrative leave and launched the investigation because uh, as administrators around the country are, uh, they're afraid of student activist groups, which by no means represent the majority. I mean, the majority of students, especially at a um, ladder climbing, uh, you know, uh, uh, legal professional school uh, at a place like in, in Washington, D.C., like Georgetown, the vast majority just want good jobs and get networked and, and what have you. But the the very vocal uh, minority who is you know, are cowing their uh, classmates uh, often, uh, you know, uh, peer pressure to, to sign letters and make denunciations. It's kind of a Maoist sort of uh, unhealthy uh, campus culture. They pressure administrators as well. And we've seen um, around the country in different contexts that uh, if administrators from the beginning uh, stand up for due process or free speech or other policies that are well considered and well written, and most schools actually do have on paper uh, good policies, then they put down the the unrest uh, fairly quickly. Um, but uh, if they if they try to kowtow, it's um, it doesn't help them, frankly. And I think uh, Dean Trainer is probably facing that right now. He kicked the can down the road four years, uh, sorry, four months. It felt like four years. <laughs> right. uh, and now, uh, as I'm you know writing my Wall Street Journal op ed and talking about getting ready to go and host a a diversity of thought in my classroom and that everyone's welcome and will be treated equally. He's being uh, pilloried by those same woke activist groups. Oh, yeah. uh, um, I don't know if you've, uh, if your producers found the, the latest black law students association tweet and statement from late last night. Um, but if anything, it's even more uh, strident than, um, than what you just read. Yeah. They're essentially saying we never, we never, you know, we're basing our complaints on him being an actual Georgetown employee. Um, they're not satisfied. They 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 want to scalp. And, you know, and, and we they, they have a demand for the dean to define exactly where the line is between conservatism and racism, as if that's the spectrum. Uh, at a certain point, they <laughs> criticized the dean for uh, calling my tweets as attacking females, black females, where there's some there's some uh, nomenclature dispute over female and woman. I, I might have to consult a biologist to understand yeah. what that's all about. There, there are none, especially on the sitting Supreme Court. And, and the, the the justice who was then later nominated doesn't know either. Speaking of black women. Um, so, the by the way, that, I think she's qualified to be on the Supreme Court. Let, of course let's, she at is. At the outset, yes, make course. clear that my tweet in no reasonable world can be interpreted as saying as no black women are qualified to be on the Supreme Court, which is how those acting in bad faith uh, willfully misconstrued it to propagate this uh, this attack. Yeah. No, as compared to Katanji Brown Jackson, I am a lesser white woman. <laughs> and uh, and a potential <laughs> seat on the Supreme Court. I don't have anything like her credentials or experience. That's what you were trying to say. It didn't have anything to do with really your an objection on your part to race or to gender. It was that you were getting somebody lesser than the guy I think he should choose. And it's sad that this guy won't even be considered because he doesn't have the right, you know, 
gender and he doesn't have the quote e- right even race. though he's a member of a racial minority group and an immigrant but yes uh, but not the not preferred not the preferred yeah. so yeah. this is where things got really crazy it was already crazy so this whole story's already gotten so out of hand but then <laughs> i'm sorry to laugh Ilya, but you gotta laugh a little then they had like sit-ins at georgetown law over you and we played some of this because national review got their hands on some of the tapes and it was just you, you couldn't believe your eyes we we're like yeah I, th- I think i made nate hokeman's career there at national review the young young totally. writer who's like on the shapiro beat the last few months <laughs> well it was shocking stuff it was like wait what did he do again you know like what what exactly did he do they had meetings with dean trainer uh he was front and center in all of this he he this is actually um from from Nate, from Nate Hochman's uh, reporting, a chastened looking trainer spent more than an hour answering questions from what appeared to be the Black Law Students Association leadership team in a closed auditorium. The dean, striking an apologetic tone, echoed the language of the activists in the crowd, assuring the assembled students that he was appalled by the painful nature of Shapiro's tweets and promising to listen, learn, and ultimately do better. And we have actually clips of that where one of the students demanded reparations for the time they missed in class to attend the sit-in and a free lunch. Here's a bit of that. Sot one. And in terms of coming back to the reparation things, because like this is this is great, but we have to do so much work to catch up for all this stuff that we missed. All I'm saying is, I don't know if it's a, a couple of dinners or lunches or something, <laughs> but that would help us Wishing. because we like we can't. I can't go home for lunch now because I need to study. I have to I have to make up for this class that I lost. So it's little things like that. It doesn't have to be something that takes a year to figure out. It's like to, we know our black students or whatever group is hurting, and we're going to give them things today, whether it's snacks, whether it's counseling, whether it's whatever. But a part of that trust is to see an immediate reaction to what we are saying. But food will be great. (laughs) (laughs) We have food on the way. Okay. Okay. Stand by, because there's the the next soundbite was about the the one gal demanding cry rooms. (laughs) I'm sorry, but we need tougher people. Like, if you're going to be a lawyer, you've got to have a thick skin. I mean, and there's no fucking think, crying in litigation. <laughs> Sorry. You would think, you would think in, legal, in a legal career, you're going to face more challenging uh, issues than uh, a speaker who offends you or, or a, a tweet that you think, uh, you know, correctly or not is racist. Of course. It's like, there's, wait until you get into a courtroom. You, you want to you talk about cry rooms, you're going to have to hold it in as you get berated by federal court judges, um, by opposing counsel, 100 percent, by jury jurors who, after the fact, go out and publicly say you sucked. You know, like you got to hold it together, people. But uh, tell that to this group, because here they are demanding this dean to give them a place to cry over your tweets. It is really, really hard to walk out of class or a meeting in tears. And you should always have a place on campus where you can go and feel like you're not then also under people's eyes and observation if you don't want to answer a question of what's going on or what's wrong. And if you're finding that you're not getting the person you want to talk to or not getting a space that you need, reach out to me anytime, anytime, uh, and we will find you space. So that's Dean Trainer, who's totally into the cry rooms, correct? That, that was the associate dean. I, I forget what his name okay. is. Uh, 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 Mitch. Uh, I, I forget his name now. But uh, yeah. Um, look, uh, people's feelings were hurt. Um, uh, some people were offended. Um, but I mean, come on. Uh, I'm, happy to, you know, I'm, hap- I'm happy to meet with, with any students and discuss uh, what concerns they have. I already said what I had to say about the tweet. And I, you know, I kick myself to this day that, uh, you know, I pride someone, I, I'm someone who prides himself on communicating well, both orally and in written form. And, and this was a failure in communication. And I, but you you're know, not a perfect man. No, I mean, no, no one no. is. I, I bet you Dean Trainer's got some things he's said <laughs> or written that he doesn't um, want thrown back at him. You know, Megan, one thing I've learned through this ordeal is that uh, we as a society, I think, have lost our understanding of of grace and of seeing your political enemies or social enemies, for that matter, 
uh, not simply as, um, you know, we now, we now see them not simply as wrong, but as evil. Uh, and everything is unforgivable, uh, and in an academic context, uh, uh, so many things, are, you know, everything's racist or sexist or offending. Um, the latest hierarchy of intersectionality is, uh, as, I, as I cheekily put it. So it's, you know, perhaps my eyes weren't sufficiently open as I was transferring to Georgetown from, from mm. Cato, because I think if I had stayed at Cato and made the same sort of commentary, um, not, you know, the same thing wouldn't have happened. There would have still been a bit of a Twitter storm, uh, but, you know, Cato wouldn't have fired me or investigated me. Um, yeah, that's right. Now they were silent, uh, after this all happened. And that was, they didn't come to your defense? that was telling and disappointing wow. after nearly 15 years of service and purportedly being an institution that supports the freedom of speech you would think they would have plenty of reason to come to my defense, issue yeah. statements, and they did not. And that's been one of the few uh, disappointments or negative surprises in terms of people who have acted or not uh, in my defense. But it's kind of a gift, too. It is a gift. I mean, one of the gifts of going through something like this is, as you point out, you find out who your friends are, and you find out who your friends aren't. You know, And that list is significant as well. It's better to know. You know I'd rather know this person was only attached to me because whatever they thought I was famous or powerful or, you know, in your case, powerful and well-known and sought after and respected. And then the second you've got a bruise, they run. Okay, great. I, that's perfect. Cause that's information I didn't have about you before this happened. So better, better to be armed with it. Disappointing, but better to know. Which isn't to say that my my many friends and former colleagues at, at Cato didn't reach out, you know, personally. Uh, I must say, it's not that, you know, everyone affiliated uh, with the institution has uh, pledged some sort of omerta, but there, there is some, um, and it's been noticed in legal circles mm -hmm. and libertarian circles. Um, mm -hmm. There. Well, that's the thing. It's like, it, it, that's the test. Is it's like when your friends are down. Number one, do you kick them? And number two, do you? at least stay out of the Twitter, Twitter mob, right? Like that's the, but, yeah. but ideally defend them. I mean, that's the ideal is to actually say a word. And he, I listen to those guys on national review, talk about this at length in the podcast saying, yeah, okay. It wasn't a perfectly worded tweet. We all get that, but you got to look at this guy. Like you got to know who this person is. You got to, you got to like examine the man and see like this, you've devoted your life towards constitutional scholarship. Like this is a worthwhile task and you're not some bomb thrower, you know, some flamethrower. No one wanted to acknowledge that or give you the benefit of the doubt in any way. One of the other things on the students, which kind of stood out to me because you mentioned FIRE, uh, and I love FIRE. They're a great organization, and um, they stand up for free speech on, on campus. She, she pressed the dean to send out an email attacking the critics of the Black Student Law Association. And she said, quote, something that's important is to remind our classmates that are attacking us that they are only here because our ancestors were sold for them to be here. And I think that's a very important fact that is not talked about explicitly enough because we are still being attacked. So I would just appreciate in whatever message that's going out to the student body that our classmates are explicitly reminded, do not attack the people who were sold for you to have this opportunity. That needs to be something that these people are reminded of because they continue to attack us as if it is not on our backs that they are even here. This woman is talking like she is a modern day slave, like we have slavery right now. And she's enslaved at Georgetown Law, one of the most elite privileged institutions in the world. And that she is no one is allowed to criticize her or her colleagues in the Black Student Law Association group because there's a history of slavery in the United States. Well, um, st victim status is is a form of privilege uh, to turn the tables on the way the discourse works. And um, I mean, I, I really wish uh, it, things didn't work uh, that way and everyone was just treated based on the strength of their arguments, their their intellect, uh, you know, uh, what they contribute to the community, uh, what grades they get, uh, what institutions they build, all of those sorts of things. But uh you know, we're told from some institutions that considerations of merit are, are racist in and of themselves or mm -hmm. operation of logic or the scientific method. These these sorts of things 
uh, are racist. I mean, if everything is racist, then nothing is. And that's the real problem here. You know, you see those side by side statements. What you just read uh, could have been uh, 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 read effectively by a white supremacist organization. It's the horseshoe theory where the the most identitarian uh, on the left from the uh, the, uh, um, the the racial minority groups match their rhetoric. You know, the 69 project, the 19 project or what have you with the most strident uh, white supremacist uh, mm-hmm. racist organizations uh, in, in their racial essentialism. And I think it's really a, a negative trend uh, that has certainly infected academia, but obviously has spilled out into the greater world. It's like this idea from a Georgetown Law School student, somebody who's, you know, one, one of the leaders of the legal profession in years to come to, to suggest that she cannot be criticized because she's black and there's a history of racism in the United States that you may not criticize her or anyone in this group is insane. I mean, it's, it's deeply disturbing to me, and I can't wait to see how it goes for her when she gets out into the real world and starts actually practicing law, because there's a whole slew of criticism coming her way. She will be torn apart. She will be called an idiot. She will be told her ideas are terrible, that she doesn't belong at her firm or on this case or writing this brief. That's how it goes. Litigation or corporate law. It's just it's not bean ball or, or maybe not so much anymore, Megan, because these sorts of attitudes have certainly crept into the major law firms and general counsel's offices of corporate America. Um, it's uh, the, the 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 legal industry as a whole, uh, you know, from the ABA setting out credentialing requirements for law schools that now incorpor- incorporate certain diversity rules and equity rules and what have you. Uh, through um, how uh, affirmative action and racial preferences are practiced in in different settings, um, uh, you know, I'm not so sure necessarily that um, uh, you know that that kind of attitude necessarily will result in negative repercussions. Oh my gosh! I mean, that's that would be the most disturbing thing of all. I mean, what are people going to do? Start seeding arguments in court because the, the of the skin color of opposing counsel? That's Madness. Um, that that cannot be. But you're right. I mean, I know that the law schools have become wokeified. The students certainly are. And that does lead me to the question of why are you doing this? again? <laughs> no, wait, don't answer that yet. I'm going to give you the break to think it over. I'm going to squeeze in a commercial break. And Ilya Shapiro answers that question when we come back. Uh, don't go away. Black Rifle Coffee Company is a veteran-founded company serving premium coffee to people who love America. They develop their explosive roast profiles with the same mission focus learned as military members serving this great country. Black Rifle Coffee imports high-quality coffee beans from Colombia and Brazil, and then they roast them five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee, and Salt Lake City, Utah. Why do you care? Because that means you get the greatest beans roasted in the closest place. So that's the freshest coffee possible to you, no matter where you live. Enjoy the awesome packaging uh, and the unique flavors like Silencer Smooth, Lava Panther, and all of them sound super cool and delicious. The best way to enjoy Black Rifle's freedom-filled coffee is with the Black Rifle Coffee Club. When you join the club, your brew of choice is roasted, packaged, and shipped free to your door and your schedule. I love it because I don't even have to think about it. I never run out of coffee. Not only do you save a trip to the store, you receive special discounted pricing on roasts, you gain access to exclusive products, partner discounts, and you get to be part of the coolest club on the planet. Literally a win-win scenario. You can buy it at BlackRifleCoffee.com. Use the code MK at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. BlackRifleCoffee.com slash MK. Use that code MK for your discount. Black Rifle Coffee is America's coffee. My whole team was talking on the break like this isn't going to last. Like, how, how can this last? Yeah, especially with uh, the end of term Supreme Court decisions and even more when the students are back on campus this fall when the Supreme Court takes up uh, the Harvard Affirmative Action case. And I'll be giving public comment, including uh, probably to you uh, in a way that they won't like. Um, look, when I when I took this job, when when Randy Barnett and I started talking about how to move uh, the center into its uh, into its second decade, it's now celebrating 10 years now, but we want to elevate its presence as an energy center for originalism, for constitutional interpretation. 
Um, I thought that this would be an opportunity to, um, uh, for me to kind of uh, have a different sort of impact with students have ba being based at an academic institution rather than an explicitly ideological think tank. And then for the students and judges, practitioners who I get involved in programming uh, to learn from me and to um, uh, to expand upon originalism and 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 have hopefully a better constitutional judicial uh, conversation. Uh, whether that is going to be feasible now, um, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, Dean Trainer uh, expressed to me as I wrote in the Wall Street Journal that uh, he wants me to succeed, and uh, as long as I behave professionally, that he will have my back. Uh, what does that mean? I'm not sure. I don't. I still don't think that tweets are firing offenses, but. Uh, um, we'll see, uh, what, whether we can make a go, uh, of this, uh, um, the university has policies against, uh, disrupting events, disrupting classes. You know, if I'm ceaselessly protested, uh, in my new role and the law school does not, uh, enforce its rules against that sort of thing, well, that won't be a, uh, that won't be something that, that that's feasible and we'll have to figure out where to go from there. Um, and also, you know, with the various friends that that have come out in my support and allies, I've gotten some interesting offers and, and things to do and ways to spend my time. So Good. I think I'll end up uh, all right out of all this, which doesn't justify the process. But um, that is a, an interesting question. And I'll I'm, I hope to make uh, a go of it. Um, but if it becomes uh, the environment becomes truly hostile, which is ironic because I've been accused um, by of, of creating a hostile environment by the uh, the diversity administrators who are investigating me, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, I'll have to see what the next step will be. I know, because it's one thing to send out a, a tweet that wasn't perfectly worded. It's another to be punished, as is very likely going to be the case, for your viewpoints, for your genuine, genuinely held viewpoints on, as you point out, for example, the affirmative action case uh, or any other or, or the growing DEI commitment that we see at all these institutions, something fire Greg Lucianas, um organization, we had him on the show, has been pushing back against saying you cannot mandate that you cannot mandate that professors seeking tenure commit to DEI and certain expansive programs. That's mandated speech. And those things are fraught. It, they have a nice name, but they're fraught once you start to peel away the layers of the onion. And so, like, if you're not on board with that, as a lot of conservatives see that that's not really what it what it says it is, you could get punished. As, as I read Trainer's uh, letter announcing that you were coming back, he says the following: um, Georgetown Law is committed to preserving and protecting the right of free and open inquiry, deliberation, and debate. Okay, great. Hope that's true. We have an equally compelling obligation to foster a campus community that is free from bias and in which every member is treated with respect and courtesy. I'm committed to continuing to, to strive toward both of these indispensable goals. The problem is that respect, courtesy, and anti-bias could mean anything, right? <laughs> it could mean anything. And it's it's going to be really hard for him to uphold both of those goals at once. I mean, it used to be we could go and slug it out and maybe it wasn't perfectly respectful in the eyes of everybody there, but that's what college is for to duke it out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you, you say that uh, I might be persecuted for my viewpoint or uh, as just happened with uh, Josh Katz, a professor at, at Princeton. Princeton who was stripped of his tenure and fired um, you know, some pretext will be generated to punish someone for their viewpoint. So the next time, you know, might not be a tweet. It might be something that I've already said to you, taken out yeah. of context, some clip uh, that uh, emerges uh, this fall during the Harvard Affirmative Action case. Uh, and that's being pointed to as well. Now that's the second incident where he, quote unquote, misspoke. Uh, and so clearly that's a pattern of, of, of his racism, uh, something like that. Uh, you know, that's uh, certainly within the realm of possibility. Is it is it scary being here and talking so openly about it? I mean, to your credit, this is this is brave of you. Um, I don't want to oversell it. I, I'm not into patting myself on the back. Um, I, I like talking to the media. I certainly respect what what you've done uh, professionally. I think, um, you know, I've developed certain skills in conveying 
ideas and translating the highfalutin academic theories uh, down into, as my, as my judge who I clerk for, I uh, like to say, got to chew it up for the little goats to eat it. Um, Cause I think it's important. I think it's important for the American people to understand uh, what the Supreme court is doing, uh, how our law works, how the different branches work. Um, Cause we have a real crisis in our public discourse. And if I can contribute to uh, alleviating uh, ignorance and fostering more civil discourse, that's what I'm, that's what I'm all about. And at the end of the day, if someone wants to take, um, disciplinary action against me or, you know, some, the next cancellation campaign. What this process has taught me is that I think I'm going to be okay. I have enough friends. I have enough of a profile at this point that I think I might be okay. Now, it might not be the planned career transition that I had in mind, yeah. um, but, you know, the real problem with cancel culture, with, you know, people who are uh, really brave are those who don't have the sort of you know platform that don't have Megyn Kelly asking uh, to interview them, that don't have the Wall Street Journal saying, yeah, we'll take whatever comment you have after this decision is made. Uh, and that includes professors. It's not, you know, before we even get to the average people that get, uh, you know, fired or doxxed or, or boycotted for contributing 20 or 100 bucks to some politically incorrect cause, uh, that's terrible enough. Uh, but even other professors or, or, or high-ranking business people that don't have a platform per se, yeah. uh, and lots of horrible things uh, uh, happen to them. So, um, you know, as long as I have uh, the ability and, and the, the analytical capacity to bring something to the table that folks like you want to hear about, uh, I'm going to keep talking. You know, they're not going to shut me up. You know, next time I slip up and, and say something poorly, you know, I'll, I'll own up to it. Uh, always. I try to be, uh, uh, honest and fair. Um, but, but, but look, life is too short. Um, and as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the, the great Soviet dissident, uh, um, uh, said, uh, live not by lies, let the lie triumph, but not through me. So you are not going to be able to, um, to hold me down. You know, I'll, I'll be careful with my, with my, with my tweets and, I have a whole new approach to Twitter these days anyway, but, but, but even beyond that, I think it's important to talk about what's going on uh, in our public life, honestly and forth, forthrightly. And if someone wants to lie about that and slander you, you know, that's on them. Oh, I love your attitude about it. You've gotten to a healthy place. I know they're going to make you do DEI training, implicit bias, cultural competence, and non-discrimination training. Yeah, all uh, that then, stuff clearly uh, susses out or converts the the real racists. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so it's like all the studies have proven that actually that actually makes people more racist if it's implicit or it's like you know, sort of this um, quiet simmering bias. These these studies bring it out. That's what the studies have shown. But the universities won't listen. And you must make yourself available to meet with student leaders concerned about your ability to treat students fairly. I'm sure that will be a joy for you, Ilya. Um, I actually wonder whether they'll want to meet with me. Um, you know, the, the university folks I've talked to said it doesn't necessarily have to be a town hall. It just might be, you know, if someone wants to arrange a meeting or whether it's the Black Law Students Association or just anyone. Uh, I don't know if they're going to want to come to like office hours or a, uh, you know, reparations lunch or something like that. Uh, and, and <laughs> I and predict you're going to get the gal who's like, you remember, uh, how did she put it, uh, that it was my back on which you're even here. Okay. Do not attack the people who were sold for you to have this opportunity. So you better prepare a line. In, to be in clear, I don't want to attack the students. You know, I want to educate. Not. I want to. You know, and, and, and to be clear, my my classroom, my programs are open to all and I can promise that everyone will um, have the freedom of speech and, and be treated uh, equally uh, and fairly. Yeah, well, we're well, definitely going to be watching that piece of your next chapter with great interest and 100 percent rooting for you. Um, but while I have you here, I want to take advantage of your legal mind, if you don't mind. I've seen some of your writings recently on guns. Last night, President Biden made a big speech on guns, seeming to suggest he wants to bring back the assault weapons ban that was in place from 94 to 04, um, or at least that piece of it that bans high capacity magazines and on and on. Uh, sort of similar rhetoric to what we've heard from him for many years now. And I've I mean, you tell me what your view of it is, because right now there's a case pending before the U.S. Supreme Court on guns that most people expect to go in in favor of Second Amendment advocates. They're not tightening gun laws right now. They're not restricting their interpretation of the Second Amendment 
or so we believe from oral argument. And so, and nor is there the political will for an assault weapons ban. Uh, but he says it worked. He said mass shootings have tripled since it expired. And, uh, you know, that there's a moral obligation to do something. Your thoughts on it? Um, so it did not work. Um, no studies show that there was less gun violence attributable to the uh, assault weapon ban, whether there's more mass shootings. Yes, we have seen more mass shootings uh, in recent years, uh, although since the ban ended nearly 20 years ago, it's hard to compare, you know, 94 to 04 to, to recent years because there's a lot uh, of other things going on. Uh, but more broadly, most crime in this country is not uh, mass shootings uh, and it's not committed with so-called assault weapons. And by the way, the way assault weapons seem to be defined as semi-automatic rifles. That's pretty much all rifles that aren't, uh, you know, shotguns. It means you you pull the trigger and each time a, a bullet comes out. These are not machine guns. These are not uh, automatics. And um, there's a whole, uh, you know, uh, mis misapplication of, of, of words here. Uh, yeah. But also, you know, more people get killed through um, uh, people's bare hands and and feet uh, than than rifles. In 2019, I just pulled up a statistic. There were about 14,000 people murdered in this country. Uh, nearly half of them were with a handgun. 1,500 of them, about 10% with knives, 4% with hands or feet, and about 3% with rifles. And that doesn't distinguish between semi-automatic rifles and, say, a single-shot uh, 22 rifle. So anyway, this is all trying to um, uh, reach for easy solutions for tough problems or problems that are simply I insoluble because they're cultural or they they have complicated uh, 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 roots. And you know the most the, the latest uh, uh, horrific shooting at the at the elementary school seems to be a complete breakdown of not of the background check system. He passed his background check. Um, but of the police uh, standing around, not going in with an active mm -hmm. shooter situation, contrary to the training that they just received. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we pile on new legislation that has uh, little chance of, of changing things, why not enforce our existing rules or against sales uh, to straw purchasers or felon in possession? By the way, those existing rules and laws will disproportionately affect uh, racial minorities. Um, these are tough issues uh, to deal with, uh, particularly in the debates over, you know, George Floyd and 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 police misconduct and and what have you. But there are no easy solutions, and certainly uh, certain things that Biden is proposing, maybe uh, more and better red flag laws, so that people who are uh, uh, you know seemingly crazy or are a threat to themselves or other people, they have to be narrowly drawn with plenty of due process protection, so they're not locked out of your rights forever and sort of things. You know, so certain things there are there, there's room to discuss, but uh, the assault, the so-called assault weapon ban, that's a that's a cosmetic thing that uh, really, um, you know, most as I said, the most common handgun used in crime is is a handgun. And yeah, and nobody's right. talking about that because it, it can't be done. And that's the best gun for for self-defense as well. And the most deadly school shooting ever was committed with handguns at Virginia right. Tech. Um, we, the guy had two of them and unleashed you know, carnage. It, and that was a failure guns. of the background check system because That's he actually right. had a record of mental illness that was disqualifying that did not get into the record system. Right. So again, so existing like rules are there and there's a failure of existing structures. Yeah. Quickly, uh, before I let you go, got to ask you about Supreme Court. Leaker. And by the way, I'm not a gun nut. I have never owned no, a gun. You're Canadian. I'm a constitution. Call me a constitution <laughs> nut, but you know. <laughs> um, Supreme Court leaker. What the hell? Only this week, the marshal asked for the cell phone records of the clerks. I'm starting to lose faith in the marshal, Ilya. How about you? This infuriates me. I've, I'm losing even more faith in Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, if he really wanted to come to the bottom of this, as he expressed his outrage you know, when it happened a month ago, then you know you ask for all the phone records and the email records of the clerks, of the justices, of the staff that had access um, you know, and not not because it's a criminal investigation and um, but because this is a very serious threat to the functioning of the Supreme Court. This is an unprecedented circumstance. Um, you know, the, the, the leaker needs to be caught. The leaker needs to be punished. Now, um, I don't know. The, the leaker may be celebrated with a uh, professorship at Yale Law School or a contributorship mm -hmm. on MSNBC or something. But 
um, they need to own up if they think what they did was was heroic. Yeah, the leaker may wind up being a colleague of yours at the Georgetown <laughs> Constitution <laughs> Center. <laughs> they may welcome her with open arms. All right, listen, thank you for your analysis. Thank you for your honesty. And uh, come back anytime. Next time we'll talk about more about the news and hopefully not at all about you and your job troubles because there won't be any. That's my hope. Well, next time I might be coming to you asking for a job, Megan. We'll see how things go. It's done. Consider it done. It would be my honor. Ilya, all the best to you. Thank you. Take care. Lots of love. Wow. So it's just like it's so wrong. It's so wrong what they did to him. Just remember that. You know, there's a real human behind these cancel culture mobs with families and kids. What we're doing to one another is wrong. All right. When we come back, Mark Stein is with us. I'm very excited to have him. We used to work together at Fox News a bit, and I always loved his commentary. He's coming on. We're going to talk about all things royal and beyond. And don't forget, you can find the show on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east, the full video show at youtube.com slash Megyn Kelly. You tired of feeling like someone's always watching you on the Internet? Maybe advertisers know a little bit too much about you, or you're concerned about the privacy of your identity? Using incognito mode will not solve the problem either. IPVanish VPN is here to protect your right to privacy and to help you stay anonymous online. IPVanish helps you safely browse the internet without exposing your private details to third parties. You can use IPVanish on your computer, tablet, phone, even devices like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. When you use IPVanish, all of your data is encrypted. IPVanish makes you virtually invisible online. It's that simple. IPVanish is offering an incredible 70% off their yearly plan for our listeners with a 30-day money-back guarantee. That is like getting almost the entire year for free, nine months for free. IPVanish, super easy to use as well. All you do is tap one button and you're instantly protected. Take your privacy back today with a brand rated 4.6 out of 5 on Trustpilot. Go to IPVanish.com slash Megan and use that promo code M-E-G-Y-N to claim your 70% savings. That's I-P-V-A-N-I-S-H dot com slash Megan. Welcome back to the Megan Kelly Show, a spectacular celebration happening in the United Kingdom where they are marking Queen Elizabeth's 70 years on the throne. She was seen beaming with pride yesterday on the balcony of Buckingham Palace, along with Prince Charles, Prince William, and all the other senior royals. Last night at dusk, she led an incredibly moving ceremony at Windsor Castle. She pressed a small globe, which set off a river of lights across the lawn. Look how pretty that is. Um, It also signaled the beginning of a chain reaction of lighting ceremonies across the UK and the Commonwealth. However, she did not take part in today's church service at St. Paul's Cathedral, the palace saying that she had felt some, quote, discomfort during yesterday's festivities, so she needed to rest. She's 95 years old, and she's got something planned for this evening. Uh, So it is a big few days for the queen. And in addition, she reportedly got to finally meet her great-granddaughter, Lilibet. Yes, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle finally found the time to introduce their daughter to the, is she 95 or 96? My script here says 96-year-old monarch. 96, okay. It's Prince Harry's and Meghan's first time back together in the UK since 2020, since Megxit. And today, when they emerged from St. Paul's Cathedral, well, I'm t- take a listen to this. I've listened to it a couple times. They received a bit of a frosty reception. You can hear some cheers and plenty of booing in the crowd. Listen. I was joking with my team before the show that, you know, that they were each thinking those boos are for the other one. (laughs) And my team was saying, no, they're thinking, oh, these racists booing us. (laughs) My guest now uh, grew up in England and has met like many, many members of the royal family. He's got some great fun stories of his own history there. He's also an old pal from the Kelly file. His name is Mark Stein, and he's host of the Mark Stein show on GB News in Britain, which is a great, great channel. Mark, great to see you. 
Hey, great to see you too, Megan. Good to be back with you. I'm so happy, first of all, that you're with GB. I love what they're doing over there. I love their mission. I love Dan Wooden and so many of the yeah. anchors over there. So congrats on, on finding a spot with a great place. No, no, it's been it's been great fun, and uh, it, it's it's a scrappy little station, but we did quite credible coverage of the Jubilee yesterday, so I'm thrilled with how it's going over there. Yeah, it's it's going very well now. Um, mm. Okay, so let's talk about what this is about. Seventy years on the throne that officially makes her the longest reigning monarch ever, right, in Great Britain's history. Yeah, she's the longest reigning. Uh, British monarch. In Canada, they say she's the longest running monarch of the uh, British uh, of the modern era, because back when it was still New France, Louis the whatever it was actually reigned for 72 years. So she's got a couple of years to go yet mm. uh, to be the longest as as this idiotic way of looking at it in Canada goes. <laughs> but in, in the UK, she's she's the longest running. She took the throne or uh, at, at 26, right? She was, that's when her mm. father passed. So, I mm. mean, the things that this woman has seen and been through and the fact that she's still, we're running a tape of her, you know, in black and white coming out when she had just been coronated. And the, fa the fact that she's still walking out in that balcony, Mark, and yeah. to the beloved British people below really says something about her commitment to this role and to her country. Yeah, she was first on that balcony on VE Day in 1945 when the Germans surrendered and she came out uh, uh, with her father and mother onto that balcony and then she and her sister slipped out of the palace among the crowds of on the streets of London and uh, that's how... So she's now been on that balcony for almost 80 years. She's been on the Canadian $20 banknote since 1935, that's like 87 years. So, uh, you know, th this is not how we think. Po politicians come and go. But if you have a non-political head of state, uh, the, the, the memories go back a lot further. Well, I, I heard you say something in defense of the monarchy that I thought was intriguing. And it was right along these lines about how politicians here in America, for example, have a little too much power. I think some of us feel uncomfortable mm. with the amount of power they have or they think they have or we've given them. And you see the queen in a way as a check on that. Explain. Yes, I think that I think it's in healthy. I think it's actually a design flaw. I don't want to send uh, your uh, previous constitutional scholar to uh, get his head exploding or anything. But I actually think it's a design flaw to have a combined head of state and head of government. It's very necessary to have something that's bigger than politicians or your politicians start getting all queenly. I mean, uh, Nancy Pelosi is far more queenly than the queen is in terms of putting on airs and graces and expecting to be flown around. Uh, you wind up even with an hereditary political class. The only reason anybody gives money to Hunter Biden or to Jim Biden is because they're the son and brother of the connected president. Same same reason anybody gives jobs to uh, Chelsea Clinton. They, nobody wants really to pay $4 million for a speech by Chelsea Clinton on diarrhea in Africa, but it's <laughs> because of the proximity to pass. You end up with all these pseudo monarchical things. And one of the things I love, especially for Republicans, there's a lot of Republicans in you know Australia and Canada, uh, but the great thing about if you have a monarchy is it uh, arouses a certain chippiness in their subjects. So people are always, you wind up with far less corruption. Uh, when William and Kate were in Canada, the Royal Canadian Air Force, which was flying them around, decided to uh, refurbish the accommodations and buy them a couple of comforters. And so the press all complain, why do we, why do Canadian taxpayers have to pay for these pampered little princelings to fly around our country? And the lady from the RCAF who'd bought the comforters said she'd gone to Canadian Tire, which as its name suggests is a very uh, basic kind of store. And they'd had a great deal on two comforters for 120 bucks. And it was such a great deal that she'd bought a second set for herself. And so I think actually having people running around calling themselves duchesses and prince actually keeps the, the citizens on their toes too and makes, mm. so you'd never be able to get away with your stupid 48 car motorcade like the president has here because mm. people would just be resentful of it.
I, I never consider the monarchy in this way, but I like it. I, you're talking mm. me back into it. I'm going to look at George Washington totally differently now. Maybe you weren't as smart as I thought. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, in fairness, you know, George Washington, that uh, George Washington, and there was some talk at the time that he would be known as his most excellent highness uh, or whatever, and he chose not to do that. But the fact is, since then, the you, you've wound up uh, with a monarchical presidency and ludicrously, mon- you know, the Queen got stuck in traffic yesterday on the way from Windsor Castle to Buckingham Palace. She was a little late arriving. She got stuck on uh, the motorway, the uh, the interstate, as, uh, as you say, uh, and uh, that would never happen for the mm-hmm. president because the president, when he when he came to Vermont, the, pres- the vice president came to Vermont. They closed basically the entire road system of Vermont for the vice president. I mean, that's that's there's nothing in the least bit Republican about that. Wow. No, there isn't. I, it's a good point. Um, and now you've got people, you know, acting like they're entitled to that, although that's a problem we have across mm. industries here in America. Good. Just go go back and read Rosie O'Donnell's book where she talked mm. about how, thanks to her fame and celebrity, she got to the point where she believed she could just run the red lights because she was yeah. so famous. Look how that ended. Um, OK, mm. so let's talk about the significance of what we're watching, because I don't think most Americans totally understand, like, what what's the jubilee? What's the trooping of the colors? And what does it mean <laughs> that, you know, the, only the senior royals were on the balcony, notably absent were the mixit couple. So just put it in perspective for us, what's happening and, and what we're looking at. Well, uh, we're celebrating uh, basically an extraordinary 70 year reign, if you think about it. Uh, in U.S. terms, Harry Truman was in the White House. Joe Stalin was in the Kremlin. Chairman Mao had just taken over in China. There is nothing that survives of 1952 except this woman. And uh, she survived in an industry in which for the last century, it's been taken as inevitable that crowns don't survive. You know, all her cousins in uh, in the German Empire, in the Russian Empire, um, her more distant ones in the Habsburg Empire, you take the Ottoman Empire, they're all gone. And she's somehow managed to cling on and cling to, you know, an awful lot of valuable real estate all, all around the world. And that's, I think that's helpful too. I think it's, I, I was, I mean, I don't want to do a lot of name dropping or whatever, but I was, I was at Buckingham Palace. I think I can tell this because I think I'm the only guest still alive. Um, I was at Buckingham Palace for a small private dinner a few years ago. And at the end of it, uh, we're, we're all sort of relaxing and in the easy chairs and kicking off our shoes. And somebody said, uh, started one of those after dinner conversations on who's the most impressive person you ever met. And the Queen's husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, said, oh, uh, I would have to say, after a bit of thought, he said, I would have to say Vincent Massey and Sir Robert Menzies. And Vincent Massey was Canada's Governor General in 1952. And Sir Robert Menzies is the longest serving Australian Prime Minister. And I can guarantee you that nobody else in that room had given those guys a thought in several decades. But they're they're like the icebergs. It's the seven eighths below the the surface. It's what uh, Abraham Lincoln called the mystic cords of memory, uh, and it's a lot easier to bring those to the surface uh, uh, under a, a monarchical system. How is it that you were invited to go to Buckingham Palace for a dinner and to just hang <laughs> with the royals? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my assistant in New Hampshire who uh, was very New Hampshire focused. She, she, she was a little bit interested in stuff from Maine, uh, not so much in Vermont and no interest at all in Massachusetts. But the telephone rang one day and she picked it up. She's going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then she puts her hand over the mouthpiece and goes, some palace on the phone for you. <laughs> and, and, uh, it was because uh, the Duke of Edinburgh had read a column I'd written on the European Union and wanted to hear more about it. So wow. uh, I, I agreed to go to dinner. I was the only mister there. Everybody else was an earl uh, or a viscount or That's whatever. Pressure. And I, I, I quite liked being the only mister in the room. Well, can you tell us, because I've, I've, I read this in preparing for the interview about how you had sort of boned up on 
how to say hello um, to the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's husband, Prince Philip, and uh, it didn't go exactly according to plan. No, uh, I, I took the precaution of because I'd, I I I love genuine republicanism. You know, I fell in love with New Hampshire because everything's decided at town level. So if you don't like the school district policies, you can call the guy up in the evening and yell at him about it, which is, mm. you know, tough. Uh, it's not something that uh, cabinet secretaries in Washington have to put up with. So I loved all that. And I'd been in New Hampshire so long that I'd quite forgotten all the sort of fawning and groveling you had to do. <laughs> and so I'd been boning up on it beforehand. And you have to bow from the neck uh, when you are introduced, because uh, as George V says, only a waiter bows from the waist. That mm. was his line. And so I land in London and as usual, uh, everything's a bit flustered. I'm running. I go and I change into my evening dress and I'm uh, all running a bit late and I get to the palace and I'm ushered in by the footman <laughs> and the Duke of Edinburgh's on the other side of the room. And so instead of remembering to walk up to him and bow from the neck and go, your royal highness, I just did the New Hampshire thing where I stuck out my arm and went, hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he was a bit startled, but he uh, he went oh uh, hi and shook my hand, which was very. And I feel I sort of felt bad about that when he died because uh, the last time I had to bow to the neck was uh, about uh, a year a year or two back uh, for dinner at uh, with the Queen's Viceroy in Ottawa. And uh, and so there I was completely on top with all the fawning and groveling, and I did bow from the neck, and, and she just went, oh, Mark, and gave me a, brought me in for a huge hug. Uh, so I felt, I felt in Buckingham Palace, I, I feel bad about being so informal, and uh, in uh, Rideau Hall in Ottawa, I feel bad because the Queen's vice uh declined to <laughs> accept my formality. Honestly, so I get it every which way. I can relate to this. It's not exactly mm. royalty, but um, mm. I love Cardinal Dolan, and mm. he's got a show uh, right on Sirius XM mm. too. And and I went and participated in his Christmas special, which was shot live at Sirius headquarters. And I walked in, and I've known Cardinal Dolan, I've, and I've interviewed mm. him repeatedly. He's been so super nice to me my whole life. Um, so I walk in, and he calls me Meg, which I like. Uh, only a few people call me Meg, but I like it. And uh, he, I walk in, and he says Meg, and instead of greeting him properly i said cd right <laughs> and his right hand man said uh, your eminence i was like oh my god uh, i'm going to hell uh, uh, no, no. <laughs> because, well it's the same thing it's like you it's nice to have a place in the world for formality yeah um and i'm a little disturbed by uh the duke and duchess of cambridge he'll be he'll be the next king but one and he and he says oh i'm I'm not really comfortable with all this bowing, so I don't know whether we need to have that. I, I think I think people actually like every schoolgirl loves to. It doesn't matter. It's all. It doesn't matter uh, whether it's in Mauritius. It doesn't matter whether it's in the Solomon Islands. It doesn't matter whether it's in the Turks and Caicos. Every schoolgirl loves to curtsy to the Queen. And and it's important to keep a lot of that stuff. Well, I mean, you, that reminds me of Meghan Markle complaining in her Oprah interview that no one taught me how to curtsy. They don't teach you those things. She didn't understand, Mark. You know, she didn't, she wasn't able to mm -hmm. figure it out. And uh, I'll tell you one thing she's got figured out, because watching that ceremony yesterday, she was sure to undo that window so when she was in the car yeah, so that yeah. she could be photographed. I mean, yeah. literally days after she she flew she was the only celebrity to fly to uvalde texas to make sure she had a photo op there i'm sorry that yeah. to me was an obvious press generation move and i found it absolutely abhorrent oh absolutely absolutely disgusting she didn't get the the job you know uh, my kid uh, youngest kid said to me when the uh, duke of edinburgh died last year he's he's been educated pretty much in america all his uh, his entire life. And so he was talking with his American chums and he said to me, oh, dad, you just can't talk about uh, the monarchy to Americans because they just don't get it. They think it's like a celebrity who opens supermarkets. And I think that's what Meghan uh, failed to misunderstand. She thought it was like a, a sort of 
a group celebrity. It's like the Rat Pack with tiaras or something. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that it's largely boring and it's about the subjects, and particularly if you're a minor royal duchess like her, it, it involves being, you know, colonel in chief of some island on the other side of the planet and you have to fly into and pretend to take it all seriously. Uh, then you have to go to New Zealand and open a hospital. And I think, I, and she genuinely thought, I think, that you'd be just swanning around with uh, A-list celebrities all day long and didn't give any thought to the fact that, no, you're going to be sitting in a room talking to some guy in Bangladesh who started a, a rural ambulance service for remote parts. And she had no interest in any of that. And she, uh, and she likes uh, George Clooney and Oprah. And she was entirely uh, unsuitable for the role of minor royal duchess. And it's a very sad fact, but that's just the way it is. So now they did come back. They did not get the invitation to go up on the balcony with the queen because they're not, I guess, considered senior royals. So they're not working royals mm. anymore. And mm. um, the reports I've read today say things between Harry and William appeared somewhat frosty uh, at the church. Mm. They sat on entirely separate sides the everything's choreographed and it seems the choreography has kept them away from one another when the ceremony ended we're told that again the senior royals went out to lunch uh megan and harry went back to frogmore cottage and did not join the rest of the family for lunch though she did find mm -hmm. time to introduce the queen to her great granddaughter whose name megan and harry chose to use while calling someone in the royal family racist who knows who? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. here's Lilybet. Um, so, what do you make of <laughs> the relationship there, and what we what can we can glean from these facts? Well, when you use that expression, senior royals, um, you know they've they've basically invented this That's since not Harry and Meghan chose to check out because oh. because the there's a the you know there's an order of precedence. Uh, she is he is the Queen's grandson, the Queen's second most senior grandson. So he should have a, a, a certain place in the procession behind his older brother and their kids. That's where he should come. And as they were walking out the church, he was way at the back with all the riffraff, <laughs> which gave me a spectacular laugh because essentially they've invented this idea of working royals, senior royals, just as a way of moving him, you know, from flying in uh, up front in first class all the way back to sitting in row uh, 274, right, wedged up with the riffraff right at the back. And they've and I think they're quite right. I think they're quite right to do that. You can't, you just can't have, I mean, for a start, it's all totally fraudulent. These, these two are not in show business. You know, if you're, if you are, if you are George Clooney, that's one thing. If you're Katy Perry, that's one thing. But if you're just two people who have no talent in that sphere, but you want to hang around with them all the time. Uh, you want to live on the beach at Malibu. That's just kind of sad and pathetic. You know, the, the, the Netflix deal is Netflix is tanking. Uh, and so they're not people can't afford just to throw away millions on uh, useless royals just to get their name on things. This that this Whatever it, whatever it was when they were trying to raise money through GoFundMe or one of those kinds of things to pay off uh, the mortgage on that mansion they live in, which is a multi, multi, multi million pound mansion. And I think they raised a thousand and forty seven dollars and seventy three cents. So the public, the public gets it. They don't want to pay money for them. They're, they're, the only thing they have going for them is their titles. Uh, she uses it on book spines, which, you know, generally speaking, you shouldn't do. Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, which isn't even the right style, but she, she has to use that to sell the book. Uh, it's usually the, when, when the royals are trying to break into show business, it's usually the opposite way. I, I knew Ed, Ed, Prince Edward, uh, when he was uh, the Queen's youngest son, when he was trying to pass himself off as a filmmaker. And uh, you'd, I remember the first time I, I knew him in his new incarnation, I was at a party and he came up to me and uh, he stuck his arm out as I did. And he goes, hi, Edward Windsor. 
And wow. the lady I was with turned to me and said, is that his stage name? And, and it's the opposite <laughs> with Megan here. She's basically milking. She, she actually is in show business. She's got a stage name and she's improperly using this royal title uh, because it's the only thing that makes any money for her. I'm going to go by Megan, Duchess of Sirius. From now on, that's, that's going to be my, my new self-appointed 2020, 20, no, right around yeah. there. Well, um, well since, since you came, since she came along, I prefer your spelling too. That's thank what's happened. Thank you very happened. much. I appreciate she's, uh, that. She's put me off me that, she's put me off that spelling of the name. Well, what, what do you make of the fact that there were, they were openly booed? You can hear, it's hard to hear when we just play it like over the transom here, mm. but I, I've listened to a few times. They, they were getting booed, uh, mm. she and Harry, as they walked out of the church. That's just remarkable. I mean, I realize the polls, there was a, a YouGov poll that shows the popularity of the royals. Of course, the queen remains the most popular by far. She has a net score, a positive score of plus 69. Prince William is second at plus 59. Princess Kate, plus 55. Charles, doing better than years ago. He's at plus 19. Even Camilla, Camilla is at plus nine. Then we get to Harry, minus 26. Meghan Markle, minus 42, which is down a few points from where it was not long ago. And Andrew, of course, is the least popular with a minus 80. We all know why you don't mm. pal around with Jeffrey Epstein and, and get any higher yeah. than that. But yeah. the booze I thought were remarkable. What do you make of it? Yeah, I, I think it's because they see the phoniness of it. Um, you know, they, they lied to us. They, when they, when they checked out, they said they were going to commit themselves to working for people all around the Commonwealth. And on the base, the day before they left, they went to Canada House in London, uh, which is the uh, central uh, Canadian building in Trafalgar Square. And oh, Canada, Canada, we love Canadians. They flew then out to Salt Spring Island off the coast of British Columbia on the west coast in Canada. In fact, they were living down the road from uh, a couple of old uh, rock star pals of mine, uh, Randy Backman from Backman Turner Overdrive in the mm. 70s and his son Tal Backman uh, had a big hit in the 90s with She's So High. And uh, that's because it's in Canadian terms, it's where like uh, Canadian pop celebs like to live. And they stuck Canada for a couple of weeks and then Meghan decided it was all boring and provincial and she'd had enough of Canada and preferred Beverly Hills. Well, yeah. That's fair enough, but you told a lie to get yourself out of the deal. And people don't, you know, that's what was their whole thing was. They, they always, we want to serve the Commonwealth. No, they didn't. They want to go to cocktail parties in Beverly Hills. At least be honest about it. At least be honest about it. People don't mind George Clooney being George Clooney, but they resent Meghan Markle, the most mediocre actress, uh, who can't really carry off the pretense of wanting to do everything for the little people, who doesn't understand basic things like inserting herself into a gun shooting in Texas is in the most ghastly bad taste. They get that these people are just uh, talentless self-promoters and they're mm -hmm. sick of them. Who does she think she's kidding? I'm sorry, but she did not go to Uvalde to mm. out of the goodness of her heart. She went if if she had done that, it, then we wouldn't know about it. She would have managed to get there. She would have paid private tribute somehow without going to the very spot where all the press were and laying flowers. Mm. Uh, and we wouldn't know about it. She made sure that she was photographed and she made sure that she had a bunch of positive headlines generated out of it. And the, and the sycophantic media just goes along with it as though this is an exploitative. That's what she did. She mm. exploited the death of those children so she could get herself on camera. That's the same thing Beto O'Rourke did at that press mm. conference that the mayor and the governor were having. And it's yeah. wrong. I mean, to me, I, I really think it's indicative of a, a deep character flaw that you can even think about yourself and your image in a moment like that. Yes, I don't even understand how you can be crass enough to think like that, whether whether you're talking about Beto or uh, about uh, the Duchess of Sussex, because it just instinctively you should know uh, that this incident is about the grieving parents. It's about the ramification, the police who stood in the corridor. 
Uh, these are the people who need to be in the picture. You don't need to be in the picture. You might want to help. You might want to give blood. You might want to give money to support uh, those families or whatever. You can do all that without getting on a plane. And I, I'm, a, I'm absolutely astonished at uh, seemliness, which is a word we don't hear terribly often uh, these days, but uh, I'm absolutely astonished at the way people have uh, no idea anymore about what is seemly and what is not. And that alone, to me, would be a disqualifying act, because if she were to return to being a working royal and there was to be a, you know, a, a, some kind of mining disaster in Australia or whatever, you certainly wonder, wouldn't want her doing the same thing there that she's just been uh, doing in Texas. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. Well, I know this, a lot of people speculated after Megxit that this couple, the two of them, would be the downfall of the queen. You know, somehow this would be the end of the royal family. And, uh, you know, that that's clearly not going to be the case. Like they, the other, this, the senior royals seem to have withstood Mexit just fine. And as I was thinking about it, when you were talking about the queen and how, how long she's been on the throne, there's been a lot of tumult. Obviously the Diana nightmare was mm. probably way bigger than Mexit. But what do you make of that? The speculation that somehow Meghan Markle will be the downfall of the royal family. Well, I think it it fundamentally misunderstands uh, what a royal family... You have a royal family because you're a constitutional monarchy, which is a system that uh, Britain invented. It's, it, it's taken up elsewhere. And in fact, I think if you look at the Freedom House rankings of the free, freest nations on the planet, uh, seven of them are constitutional monarchies. So it's not a bad system of government to live under. Um, you know, it's, I was listening to what Ilya and you were talking about earlier about the Supreme Court nominations uh, and and so forth. And uh, Ilya, although he was briefly Canadian, he couldn't actually make a living in Canada as a constitutional <laughs> scholar because uh, under the Canadian theory or the English theory, uh, the Queen is the state and the state is the Queen. And that's the beginning and end of it. If you look at the Canadian Constitution, I think it's... Uh, Paragraph nine says uh, executive power, it's headline, and it goes, executive power shall be vested in Her Majesty. And you think, wait a minute, where's the rest of it? Where's the mention of the uh, prime minister or elections? Uh, and there's no mention of any of that in the Canadian, the Australian, whatever constitutions. And it, it, it's because the it's a system of government. And the fact that they occasionally go to a pop concert or uh, the Duke of Edinburgh is informed at the James Bond premiere that Madonna is singing the title song and he turns to the Queen and says, I told you we should have brought the earplugs. Uh, <laughs> that kind of thing, that kind of thing is all very well, but at the heart of it, it's a system of government. And so the, the showbiz fripper is uh, are just, are just for entertainment value. Show what is that word? Showbiz fripper is fripper is uh, F R I P P E R I E S. That's <laughs> that's uh, that's there's a lot of fripper is around. I like it's it. I just, like it uh, a lot. All right, I'm going to be uh, looking that up in this quick commercial break, and we will be right back uh, with more with Mark Stein. Don't go away. Are the high fuel costs putting a damper on your summer vacay plans? From higher prices at the pump to a jump in airfare, it's definitely getting more expensive to get away for a week. But what if you could soak up those vacation vibes year round? Get a Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas. Whether you want to stay close to home this summer or just want to extend your break, a Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas can transform your backyard into an oasis. It combines the benefits of a pool with the therapy of a hot tub. This is going to reinvent family time. You'll love it and your family and friends will too. Michael Phelps Swim Spas by Master Spas come in a variety of sizes to complement almost any yard, even if it's a small one. And since it's heated, you can use it year-round in any climate. Michael Phelps Swim Spas are 100% made in the USA by Master Spas, the world's largest swim spa manufacturer. Check it out by going to masterspas.com. Put in the promo code MK 
and that will save you $1,000 on your Michael Phelps Swim Spa or $500 on your Master Spas Hot Tub. That's masterspas.com, promo code MK. So let's hit a couple of news headlines because I know you comment on everything. I know that from my days mm-hmm. working with you back at uh, Fox on the Kelly yeah. file. And I'd love to get your take as somebody, you know, uh, British via Canada and then New Hampshire, your take <laughs> on the gun debate. Because now, I mean, Joe Biden, I'll play the soundbite. He's he's pretty explicit about wanting to bring back this the so-called assault weapons ban. Uh, it's soundbite five. Let's take a listen. We need to ban assault weapons in high capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. Strengthen background checks, enact safe storage law and red flag laws. Repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability. Address the mental health crisis, deepening the trauma of gun violence and as a consequence of that violence. These are rational, common sense measures. A lot in there. What are your thoughts? He, as you say, there's a lot in there and he hasn't got the political energy to make any of it happen. I'm talking about, you know, Democrats uh, too. I, I live in New Hampshire across the Connecticut River from me is what they call the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. Uh, they're all Democrats who vote for Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders doesn't mess with their gun rights. In, in Coos County in far northern New Hampshire, they vote Democrat because uh, they they want bigger government checks to spend at the gun shop. There are not Democrat, rural Democrats uh, like Bernie Sanders, uh, Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. They are not going to go along with any of this. It's not going. It, none of it's going to happen. A lot of what he talks about has happened. There's laws on. You know, the the big problem with any any society is that if you have a small number of laws, they tend to be observed. Then when you pile on law upon law upon law upon law, background checks and all the rest of it, uh, what happens is that they all go unobserved. I mean, this guy sailed through uh, a lot of the, the laws that are already in place, as as with most of these uh, mm-hmm. these mass shooters. The fact is, uh, politically, judicially, uh, none of this is ever going to happen. Uh, politically speaking, you were talking about it from the court's point of view, but p- the political reality is this, that uh, since in the last two years, things have got a lot more dangerous on the crime front. I travel with a gun in my glove box, just tootling around, which I never did before, but I've done for the last two years, uh, simply because I've seen enough of these things where people are just out on the streets in broad daylight and uh, they're they're suddenly attacked. Uh, This is no, uh, culturally speaking, this is not a time when anybody is going to mess with American gun rights. Mm-hmm. That's not it's not going to happen. And the, mm. the truth is about these mass school school shooters, the vast majority of them get their guns from their parents cabinet. The, the vast majority mm. don't actually apply mm. for a license and actually go out and shoot with that gun. Mm. They just take the gun from their parents, um, you know, whatever vault security, wherever they keep them. His solution to that is have these mandatory, you know, lockup laws for the guns. OK, I'm sure every mm. parent's going to observe that perfectly and hide the key to where the kid could never find. Like, that is not the answer. And then so he says um, he he calls assault weapons. It's like that's not really a thing, you know. That's a, a senior, no. it's like a senior royals. That's the senior royals of gun discussions. Yeah, that's basically a category of gun that doesn't exist except when Democrats are calling for gun control. I mean, the, what, what's the old line that it's uh, there's basically a scary looking weapon that doesn't have a wooden stock. You know, I'm old fashioned because uh, I was in the cadets when I was at school. So we had old Lee Enfield rifles, uh, which was the backbone of the British Empire. And I think now it's uh, Arctic Rangers in Canada and a uh, one police department in India are the only ones who like. And I, so I'm old fashioned. So I like the wooden stock. But the fact the fact of the matter is th- these this is this is just filling up airtime on MSNBC and has no actual reality. And I think also, 
you know, I don't want to be cruel or hard hearted about this, but that, and I think the school, the school thing is well, I, I mean, my neighbors all say, oh, yeah, I was at school in the 70s and uh, I used to take my gun to school for show and tell. A lot of us boys did, and uh, we all thought it was cool and didn't mean we were going to shoot up the place. That the, the reasons for why we have an atomized society in which, uh, in, in which loners sit and fester until the point, uh, uh, it, it, they reach where it seems like gunning down large numbers of people is uh, a, a, a is the logical form of self-expression. That's actually far more dangerous. And in a country this large with this many guns, you cannot have, you cannot actually devise a regime uh, that will protect one group of people from another person. It's, mm -hmm. it's way beyond any of that. And so this is also shallow. The level at which it's talked about it is completely shallow and preposterous. And I would imagine that in a lot of other Western societies, countries that haven't had such great gun cultures, uh, they're going to find that actually they, they, they'd like to be packing heat these days mm -hmm. rather than America adopting continental ways. Well, I, I'm looking at, you know, his, his other suggestions. We should raise the age to purchase these, these so-called assault weapons from 18 to 21. Perhaps he's unaware that, that that's already been struck down. The Ninth Circuit, the mm. very liberal Ninth mm. Circuit Court of Appeals has already said, and in at least one case, that's unconstitutional. You're mm. 18, you're an adult. It's a constitutional right, and you can buy a rifle. So good luck, because that's going to pose some legal challenges if he tries to do it. Um, he goes mm -hmm. on, okay, the uh, repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability. He, he always hits this. They're the only industry mm -hmm. that has this protection. That's absurd. Mm -hmm. if, if you mm -hmm. buy a Glock and the Glock is manufactured poorly and it misfires because of the manufacturing mm -hmm. defect, you can 100% mm -hmm. sue the gun manufacturer. Mm -hmm. You just mm -hmm. can't blame someone's random gun violence on the gun manufacturer. That's, that's not some, something special to the gun lobby. That makes perfect sense. But, but they're being cynical, Megan. That's, that's the point here. Uh, Joe Biden and the Democrat. Joe Biden can't get anything through Congress on this. So he's just serving up pap uh, to, to placate metropolitan lefties who dislike the Second Amendment. But it has no real world meaning. And this is, this is again, one of the, uh, I think one of the problems in the system that you, you wind up with a guy like this. We, none of us know who's actually running the United States government, but it's clearly not him because mm -hmm. as we just heard, he wasn't even informed of the, uh, baby, uh, formula, formula. Uh, shortage until, until late April. So that you have a, so you, you have a guy who uh, they just say, you should really, you should go out. They, I, this, this is again the deformation of the presidency because you can say what you like about uh, McKinley or Chester Arthur or whatever, but they didn't live in a uh, in, in a culture where oh something's happened, go out there and say something to everybody just for the sake of saying something. This is this is absolutely, but nothing. Nothing Joe Biden says on anything, whether he's threatening regime change against Putin uh, or anything else, is taken seriously anymore. So these are just uh, th this is just presidential dinner theater and is rather pathetic in that mm. respect. I, there, well, there I don't is want a to, question. There's a, there's a question about who's calling the shots there and who's pushing these you know, crazy policies that he either has no chance of getting through or that won't do anything to address the problem he's purporting to tackle. And and that leads me to my next question, because I heard, I saw and read about um, National Review's Jim Garrity wrote this up today, and it was from a Charlie Sykes podcast. This is a conservative never Trumper, Charlie mm. Sykes. But he had a very interesting exchange with a Washington Post columnist, former reporter James Homan, about student loan, quote, forgiveness, right? It's not mm. really forgiveness. It's mm. it's a transfer of wealth from the working class to rich, elite, university graduated mm. professionals. And the only requirement is that, according to what he's thinking of, um, is that you make less than a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year? Okay, so you can mm -hmm. make a hundred and forty nine thousand dollars a year and qualify for this quote forgiveness, mm -hmm. or three hundred thousand as a married couple, and um, and you might get this debt forgiven or paid for by you know a trucker who didn't go to college because mm -hmm. he decided didn't need to or didn't want to take on debt. 
Now you're going to have to pay for somebody else's debt. So the question Charlie Sykes was asking this reporter, James Homan, who's done reporting on it, is why is he doing that? This is insane for him to be pushing this right now. And the number he's reportedly getting ready to settle on is $10,000 a person. And for the first time, there was a real answer based on this guy's reporting. Listen to this exchange. I mean, seriously, where does Joe Biden think this groundswell is going to come from except for this small group of highly entitled college graduates who dominate college graduates who dominate the staffing and the inner workings of the Democratic Party? I've asked. I've, I've repeatedly yeah. asked yeah. people uh, <laughs> and I've asked a lot of people in the White House this question. And essentially, the answer is that this is the fault of Stacey Abrams and Raphael Warnock. What? Stacey Abrams has been browbeating the White House uh, on this and says that this is the only way she can win that it, this is going to be a base turnout election. This isn't about persuading people in the middle. It's about getting the base to turn out. And the base isn't going to turn out if they don't do this. And that they have all sorts of stats about how you know, a lot of graduates oh. from HBCUs have all this data. And so there are a lot of people very close to the president who privately understand that this is a complete disaster for them. Uh, but the, the president is being pulled really hard by these woke, leftists who are who believe who believe it's all about the base and that's just they just don't get it because they haven't spent time in you know in the wow counties or in apple valley minnesota extraordinary (laughs) right it's just abrams no, that's just insane to be doing it for <laughs> Stacey Abrams. Look, the, the fact that, that there is a problem with American education. There's too much of it. People in uh, 1940, the average American had an eighth grade education. That's the America that won the Second World War and emerged as the dominant power on the planet. So when people think of the um, America's glorious 1950 moment, that that was built by eighth graders. And now we encourage everybody to stay in school to 28th grade to do, uh, <laughs> you know, transgender and colonialism studies at yep. a cost of a quarter million bucks. It's completely uh, worthless. And if you then and if you decide to do student loan forgiveness, people think, oh, yeah, I was a bit uh, I thought maybe I should just uh, leave the front door and go to work. But maybe if they're offering student loan forgiveness, I should do transgender and colonialism studies, although not just for four years, maybe for six, seven, eight years. That's the way to make an already decrepit system that is far worse than, say, China's. Uh, even worse. So it's the biggest structural defect in America today is the education system, as we've seen over the last two years, where in effect, the system has been prepared to traumatize children, Mm -hmm. rather than actually bring them back into the classroom to teach them. So then Mm -hmm. to reward what is absolute, and and I agree with 1940 America, I think K-8 is the most important education you get. If you screw that up, you can stay in school till you're 37, 48. It's not going to make any difference. Uh, so I'd like us to get K-8 back to being passingly respectable again. But if you encourage, if it, what this does is encourage absolutely the worst and most unnecessary element of the American education system. As you say, it's transferring uh, it's trans, it's, it's a wealth transfer to, from the poor to people considerably richer than them. And in that sense, it's the perfect Democrat policy. And there's something else in there that's revealing. So Stacey Abrams and Raphael Warnock, mm. um, who's senator from Georgia, thanks to that election that happened, mm. um, both are uh, black Americans concerned mm. about the black vote. That's really what he's saying that they, mm. they, that's, Students who have graduated from uh, historically black colleges and universities, uh, HBCUs, are Mm. not ready to turn out for Democrats in the midterm elections or possibly Mm. beyond, and that he needs to pay for their votes. That's basically what that reporter was saying. And we've seen him losing support with Latinos, with black voters. And and now there's a there's a five alarm fire. And these two lawmakers, well, one aspiring and one existing, are sounding the alarm saying, you better do what politicians do best, which is go buy some votes with some taxpayer dollars uh, 
to motivate people to go and support the Team Blue comes November. Yeah. Yeah, it's very what's we live in a very weird moment because uh, the the Democrat Party would not be doing what it's done the last year and a half uh, if it was thinking rationally. Um, you know, basically everything that can go wrong now has go. Oh, you can't afford to gas up your car. You can't find any uh, formula milk for your baby. Uh, you, you know, everything that can be screwed. And at the same time, we've got open borders. So uh, there's six million people coming in between now and September who'll be able to uh, help push the gas prices even higher and uh, make the uh, formula milk shortage even worse. And the Democrats have, if they were thinking rationally, they wouldn't be doing any of this. And their whole theory that you can build a coalition of the fringes uh, that will, in effect, make their uh, what their punitive policies uh, not matter. There aren't the numbers for that unless they're planning planning on, you know, serious big time electoral theft, in which case none of this matters. But the but but the fact is no rational person would govern as they've governed this these last 18 months. Mm. Well, let me ask you quickly about immigration, because I know you, you were saying something about how in Great Britain they, they're encouraging people not to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, like it's a total open border there and here. Maybe we're focusing on the wrong problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think this actually is the, you know, it's the biggest story of our time. I mean, anyone who's ever crossed into the United States from Canada, uh, where they check every little thing, you know, and they forbid you from bringing in kinder eggs for your kitties and all the rest <laughs> of it. And then you have the contrast with the Rio Grande, where everybody just walked. It's a continuous stream of people just walking in at some at some point. Uh, it doesn't have to go on that long for it to have really demographically transformative consequences. And these days, when you're looking at, I think, 40% of the planet's jobs being eliminated by artificial intelligence, nobody really needs mass immigration anymore. No country really needs it. And in that sense, the cultural issues, out uh, they, they trump the economic issues and they're far more long term and far more consequential. Yeah. So they'll, they'll try to prevent monkeypox by policing what you do in your bed, but they will not control the borders. Uh, that's a bridge yeah. too far. It's a perfect point, Mark. It, it was such a pleasure catching up. I hope you come back on. No, I, I, uh, I always uh, you you have one of the best shows out there, Megan, and I'm always thrilled when I uh, when I get to you know we've talked some serious stuff when I uh, yeah. think about the uh, Charlie, Charlie Hebdo, Hebdo shootings and things. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Oh, thank you. To be continued. Thanks for joining us today. I really enjoyed that show. I hope you did too. Two really interesting guests, uh, and we have a lot more great content coming your way next week. Our friends from the Ruthless Podcast will be back. We love those guys. Plus, for the first time ever, the hosts of the Red Scare Podcast will be with us. Very, very popular, and we're all very excited about that. David Sachs, part of the PayPal Mafia, he's coming back on. He was great the last time. And then later in the week, we're going to be doing an entire special focused on President Biden's mental fitness. You don't want to miss that. So go ahead and download the show right now on Apple, Pandora, Spotify, and Stitcher. Go to YouTube.com slash Megan Kelly. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend. 